Hello, my name is Tom McCall. I teach systematic theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And I'm joined here for a conversation on the Doctrine of the Atonement. I'm joined by Amy Peeler, who is a assistant professor of New Testament at Wheaton College in Illinois. She's written several nice articles on the use of the Hebrew Bible or Christian Old Testament in the New Testament. And she has recently, like really recently, right? Uh, just come out with a monograph entitled, You Are My Son, uh, with TNT Clark on the book of Hebrews. She's a specialist in the book of Hebrews and interested in issues related to the Doctrine of the Atonement. Thomas Williams is professor of religious studies and chair of the Department of Religious Studies as well as professor of philosophy at the University of South Florida. He's a well-known well medievalist, uh, has done really fine work in helping us understand Anselm and Scotus among others. And he is a lot of, has a lot of interest in the Doctrine of the Atonement and it's great to have you here with us today. Doctrine of the Atonement, of course, has so many different facets and angles. Um, so many different biblical texts have been taken to speak directly to it. It has so many conversation partners throughout the Christian tradition and people puzzling about it to this day. So why don't we begin by talking about some of the history, right? Let's start by talking about some of the tradition. You've written a lot on Anselm, Thomas, and Anselm is one of the names that's most widely used, perhaps someone whose theology is widely misunderstood. What do you take to be the common narrative about Anselm's view of atonement? There's a standard story about Anselm that you find in a lot of the standard histories as well as in contemporary work about Anselm or about atonement generally that cast Anselm as, as the villain who brought the theory of penal substitution to the fore, who um, taught a doctrine of atonement that, that valorized violence, uh, that talks about Christ making peace through the blood of his cross, as we read in Colossians, and, and, and therefore suggests that uh, reconciliation is somehow brought about by violence and by blood, and uh, that leads to various forms of, of oppression and, and so forth. And also a sense that what, what God is doing uh, in the atonement is beating up on an innocent victim. And the problem with all of that is that Anselm is very clear, takes very great pains uh, to defend the idea that as a matter of fact, Christ's self-offering is a voluntary self-offering. It is not imposed on him uh, by the Father, but wells up from his own purposes, from his own love for us, from his desire to reconcile us to God and bring us to the fulfillment uh, that God intended for us in creation. It's also not a penal theory because he says that punishment would not affect reconciliation. Um, and it's, for Anselm, it's really all about bringing us to the fruition of God's original purpose in creation, which is a restoration of relationship with him, which punishment doesn't accomplish. Uh, so there are actually wonderful things in Anselm that are overlooked and, and lots of uh, problems for which he's held responsible that he actually uh, didn't have. So what are some of those uh, hidden elements or often overlooked elements that are, would be most helpful for recovery today? I think the emphasis on, on the voluntariness of, of Christ's self-offering is actually really fruitful and really helpful to think about. Um, most of Cordeus Homo is taken up with what purports to be um, an account of how atonement works that does not rely on, on scripture, a sort of quixotic quest you might think. I would certainly think that. Um, but he does engage in serious scriptural exegesis on one and only one question in Cordeus Homo. He spends two chapters trying to parse passages that suggest that the father somehow commands the son to do something that the son is unwilling or reluctant to do. He's very, very wedded to the idea from uh, the fourth gospel, uh, Christ's words, I have the power to lay down my life and the power to take it up again. And that's his entree into thinking about other passages that might suggest Christ's unwillingness or, or reluctance or obedience in a sense that would make him the father's victim rather than um, the father's willing partner in our redemption. So are there elements of Anselm's thought that you think are perhaps less helpful for us today in recovery of a doctrine or maybe underdeveloped in Anselm's own thought that you would want to supplement um, as far as moving forward in constructive work on the doctrine of the atonement? There, there are lots of metaphors that Anselm uses and th that I think are not essential to the theory, but they are a big part of the way he expresses the theory. So there's a kind of commercial metaphor about 
debt. So when, when you hear Anselm's view expressed, it is we had sort of racked up an infinite debt and only a being with infinite resources can pay it, that's God, but we owe it so a human being has to pay it, therefore God has to become incarnate. And there's, that's a very crude way of expressing something that I think can be expressed uh, using other metaphors that are not as crude. And, and someone who takes Anselm seriously but wants to express that doctrine in ways that, that can be fruitful now, we'll have to find other metaphors besides, say, this commercial one, or some people complain about a kind of feudal notion, right? That we have offended our feudal lord, he insists on his honor being restored. Um, whatever medieval social history is embedded in Cordeus Homo, I think can be extracted without detriment to the theory, but it does need to be extracted if, if we're to um, have both devotional and theological profit from it. Amy, as a New Testament scholar, I'm curious how you th view Anselm's handling of certain biblical text. Yeah. Um, what do you think just of his handling of the biblical text in general? Yeah. Well, I see, I see um, reflections. Obviously, a person who knows scripture well and it comes out in echoes and allusions that may or, maybe aren't direct citations, but you know the narrative is there. It struck me in the beginning of, of his work how he emphasizes that sin comes through disobedience and life comes through obedience. That's very much kind of the narrative of the second Adam in Romans 5. And this point on voluntary, willing suffering of Christ, I think is so vital to the understanding of the atonement. And of course, as someone who spends a lot of time in Hebrews, I think of Hebrews 10 here, where a body you have prepared for me, I have come to do your will. This is a pre-incarnation speech of Christ. He knows what he's coming to do. That's not to say that it isn't difficult. And therefore in chapter five, you get the great cries and tears as he faces death, but it still is a willingness. And so you see, I think those elements in Anselm. Um, I, I also was drawn to the passages where he talks about the father and the son engaging. And I think I would add to your critique of his metaphor that if we put a bit more of the relational emphasis there, uh, the notion of debt can come across as something rather cold, like you go to a bank and take care of this. But in scripture, it's so much that our position, our identity before God has changed. We are no longer slaves, but sons, sons who can now address God as Abba, Father. And so I think to put that emphasis might bring the work of Anselm, this great exchange that Christ takes what is ours so that we can take what is Christ's uh, and to put it into a, a framework that makes more sense maybe in our own context today. As a biblical scholar, are there any moments in reading Anselm where you just mm -hmm. sit back and think, why wasn't he dealing with this mm -hmm. passage or this text? Ah, I mean, are yeah. there certain elements or themes from scripture or a particular text that you just think, Anselm's view would be different if ah. X had been mentioned. Yeah. You know, I found myself thinking uh, I, I would want to see a bit more of Old Testament notions of purity. Uh, I think sin is not just, I, I tend to think about sin usually as moral, something I've done wrong. But if you take a look at the Old Testament scriptures, which therefore inform the new, so much of it is God's holiness and purity. And I think that comes up in places. But again, if that was emphasized more, it's, it's not just the emphasis of debt, but that we are unclean. And therefore this blood is not just kind of uh, addressing what we've lack, but it also is making us pure and holy to stand before a holy God. Um, that I might want to see more of. Thomas, did you have anything you'd want to add to that or chip into that? I think the, the only further thing I'd want to say about the notion of debt is that it's helpful to go back to some earlier treatises that he wrote, uh, his, his dialogues uh, on truth and freedom and the fall of the devil in which it, it's clear that the notion of what's, what's owed or what of, of a debt really is about God's purpose for a thing in creation. So it's, if you interpret the notion of debt in light of those earlier treatises, mm -hmm. it, it does lose that kind of cold uh, commercial analogy and, ha and now talks about what is God's purpose? Mm -hmm. What does God want? What is God trying to achieve within and through his creatures? And, and then it, there's, a, there's a dynamism about it that is missing if you just see it as we've racked up an infinite negative balance oh no, how do we pay it off? Right, right. And I did appreciate also his emphasis on God's glory. Uh, I mean, this is such a dominant narrative mm -hmm. in scripture. I was just thinking again about Romans, you know, that we have fallen short of God's glory. So it really is about our relation before God and not just kind of the wrong things that yeah. we've done. It's very prominent. So Amy, as a biblical scholar, uh, one who has expertise in Hebrews in particular, there's a, there's a, quote from Hebrews chapter two that almost could sound like a direct answer mm -hmm. to Anselm's question, Cordeus Homo. Yeah. 
Um, and then Hebrews goes on to talk about Christ as, in all these different ways, which to many modern readers are just sort of baffling. Yeah. Christ is priest, he's high priest, he's also sacrifice. Um, let's start with priesthood. Can you unpack a little bit of what it means when Hebrews is affirming that Christ is high priest? Yeah. This is really the unique feature of Hebrews because of course we have the high priestly prayer in John, but that's uh, in the margins, that's not in the text itself. It's only this author who talks about Christ as Hieros and Archieros, high priest. Uh, it's such a beautiful picture because what the priest does is he comes from among humanity, he's chosen from among humanity to then offer gifts and sacrifices to God, to build that bridge. He's a mediator, these are common images. So he represents humanity and he also then goes before the presence of God. And in the Israelite model in that uh, place of the Holy of Holies once a year. Uh, so that's what Jesus is doing as priest. He comes, he takes on flesh and blood, chapter two, so that he can represent us before God. Uh, but the beautiful thing about Jesus's priesthood is that he is God, and I believe that's the affirmation of Hebrews one, the divinity of Christ, that he then builds that bridge in a way that any human priest couldn't do uh, because he is sinless as they were not. He is eternal and they were mortal. And so his priesthood can be forever. And why does that matter? Because we need someone to intercede for us forever. And that's what Christ is able to do, not just on earth, but in the very throne room of God. So what do, what's going on when we read about Christ, not only as priest, but also then as sacrifice? I think the author of Hebrews is an excellent mixer of metaphor. Um, so it makes so it's not sense. just on yeah. <laughs> Right, right. So Jesus is the priest, great, but what does he offer? A priest must have a gift to offer, uh, the author says. But here's what Christ does. He offers himself, his own body, his blood, his life. This is said throughout the letter. So he takes end to heaven. And I think Hebrews imagines the heavenly tabernacle, God's throne room, not the blood of animals, which is only cleansing of the outside, but his own blood that was shed on the cross and he takes it up as a cleansing offering uh, to inaugurate the temple of heaven. And um, so he is both priest and sacrifice. And I think this would have been quite shocking to the audience of Hebrews, the initial Jewish audience, not just that Jesus is doing both things, but that he is also king and he's uniting these pictures together. Thomas, can you help us see how Anselm fits into the kinds of discussions that are um, born out of dis the discussion of the author of Hebrews as far as priest and sacrifice. Other medieval theologians um, use that language. Um, does Anselm use it or is he presupposing this in what he's doing? My take on Anselm is that he is, he is saying very much the same sorts of things that Amy was just explaining from the letter to the Hebrews. He's a, Anselm is very much um, thinking of, of Christ in these terms as, as high priest, as the as the self-offering victim and priest mm -hmm. um but he he doesn't he's not exegeting hebrews in the sense that he's very rarely quoting from it uh, he, he quotes from it only where it looks as though it might be suggesting that christ is uh, again having something imposed on him so that he can make sure that we know that that's not what's going on um but he his thinking about that though informed by precisely the desire to see christ as offering himself um he doesn't want to use Old Testament language or temple language because, again, he set himself this task of showing the rationality of the Christian understanding of the atonement rather than exegeting scripture, explaining you know, what scripture asks us to think about Christ's sacrifice. And so I think it's a, if you wanted to take the theology of the letter to the Hebrews and the picture of Christ that we get particularly in the fourth gospel, particularly where Christ is reigning from the cross, what, what you end up with is something very much like Anselm's view, only he doesn't want to make it quite so clear how much he is indebted uh, t to that language, to those metaphors. So he tries to cast it in different metaphors, but it is a, it is a very Johannine and uh, letter to the Hebrews take on, on the work of Christ. So he's presupposing most of that and what he's doing then to make a rational case. Yeah, I think, I think his entry point into thinking about what Christ has done in order to redeem us, save us, uh, bring us back to God uh, is, is so deeply informed, um, more by Hebrews than by anything else, certainly more by Hebrews than by Romans, say. So moving from discussions of how these biblical texts inform and impact um, significant parts of the Christian tradition, to how they're being received today. 
In particular, certain feminist objections raised to classical views of atonement, um, and, it, and it, minimally at least, lots of puzzlement in, engendered by this, like what is going on uh, with this. Um, what do you take to be the most significant of those objections? I was interested to see that some of the same objections appear in Cordeus Homo. Is this not the father being mean to his son? So I think of the work of maybe Rita Nakashima Brock, who has coined the phrase that you could look at the cross as cosmic child ab abuse. That's quite provocative. Uh, I, I think the value of that is that it pushes those of us who are working from faith to seek understanding, to say that we need to be very precise in our language. We need to emphasize the importance of the voluntary nature of Christ, and I would also add the uh, a vital and robust understanding of the Trinity. <laughs> this, is, yes. uh, this is the unified action of one God appropriated by the different persons. And so when you have that correct orthodox understanding, then some of those critiques you're able to answer them in a, in a respectful and in a uh, enlightened way. But they do, I think, push us to say, you know, let's be careful how we're discussing this in our uh, classrooms and in our churches. But one other critique there is that if this is the language of suffering and sacrifice, then we should legitimate any suffering and sacrifice among people today. We also have to be very careful to say, you don't have to go out and embrace suffering. It will sometimes come to you as God disciplining and training you, but be careful never to fall into the trap of legitimizing oppression or injustice. Right, the, the idea that somehow Im imposing sacrifice, imposing suffering is in itself redemptive or somehow warranted by the Christian doctrine of the atonement I think is, is very far from the truth, and certainly Anselm uh, is very emphatic about the idea that and if the suffering is not undertaken voluntarily, it has no redemptive value. Now, there is suffering undertaken voluntarily when it comes to you, as you say, and, and you, you acknowledge God's presence in it, but to, to impose it on someone else in the idea that somehow that's going to be atoning or redemptive is far from far from the Christian idea, I think, uh, certainly far from the Anselmian idea of atonement. Amy, how would you summarize your view of Christ's atoning work? Mm. I think sometimes scripture doesn't tell us all of the details, so we need the thought, the thinkers uh, to work those out. But I would say that there is a problem, there is a disobedience, all humans have made that choice. And so God, rather than let us go into nothingness, came and dwelt among us. And Christ through his perfect life, and then his death and his resurrection, his validation, uh, he opens up the way. I love the image in Hebrews of the archegos, uh, the pioneer, that now that he sits at God's right hand as the God man, as human, has opened up the way for us to approach God's throne as well. Thomas, how would you answer that question? I really like that rootedness of the atonement in Christology. Mm -hmm. um, Ansel tends to work in the other direction, but I think we would agree that you've got to have the right understanding of the person of Christ in order to have the right understanding of the work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And those two things uh, go together so well um, if, if you understand them properly, if you think of what Christ does that only he can do because only he can be the right sort of priest. Um, and then what does that priesthood mean? It's, it's more than just the offering of the sacrifice, which is himself for our sake, but the intercession, mm -hmm. the example, um, the, the power of grace that, that is won for us by his saving acts. So y you don't need to have, and I, th I think this goes with something that you said, you don't need to have a sort of one-dimensional understanding of this. There's not one thing that Christ's life or life and death or life and death and resurrection uh, accomplish for us. Th there are all sorts of things. Scripture uses a variety of metaphors. Our liturgies use a variety of, of ways of getting at this, which we don't need to see as competing with each other, though I have to confess, as is obvious, that I'm drawn in particular to Anselm's way of thinking about these things. Um, the, the work of Christ on the cross, the work of, of Christ from, from Bethlehem, Bethlehem to the right hand of God uh, is multifaceted and its riches are inexhaustible. And uh, we do well to think about it in as many ways as we can manage to do. Thank you all both. Thank you.